As I record this video, we're approaching the third year anniversary of Fallout 76. A game that was previously revealed at E3 that same very year, it was launched with a lot of issues and to very critical reception. Even now, scores and reviews haven't quite recovered, but there has been a big turn for the game as a whole. If you're clicking on this video, you've either not played Fallout 76 or you played it at launch, were severely disappointed and decided not to play it again, and you're finally ready to see if it's worth the wait. So this video acts as my Fallout 76 three years later review. I'll be going over the initial Fallout 76 experience, as well as the Wastelanders DLC and the Brotherhood of Steel questline. Jumping into the main Fallout 76 experience or the main questline, You'll be greeted with the opening cinematic, as always voiced by Ron Perlman, which I've got to say, it doesn't matter which Fallout it is. Even when I played this the first time, this got me insanely hyped and I was really excited for this. Anyway, as for the story, you wake up in Vault 76. You are the last person to wake up, I guess, from a night of crazy partying as you begin Reclamation Day, or celebrating Reclamation Day, rather, where Vault 76's purpose was to have normal people, there's no testing or anything like that going on, and you're gonna go out into the wasteland after a set amount of time and rebuild society. Upon getting some gear and leaving the vault, you're given one specific task, and that is to find the Overseer and exactly what she was up to in the mission she set out on. Now, just that, in the initial Fallout 76 game, this would have been a wild goose chase looking around for hollow tapes as well as notes and other pre-automated tests and systems to figure out the Overseer's objective, which is to find nukes. Sorry, spoilers, but the main quest line isn't anything to write home about. I will say this from here on though, I guess there will be no other major spoilers for the actual NPC quest lines in this game. The Wastelanders and the Brotherhood of Steel quest line will not be spoiled in this video. But doing the main quest line, if that is actually what you want to do, will provide you with plenty of good Fallout content if you're just really into Bethesda open worlds. Einon Zero comes back for the Fallout 76 soundtrack, so the OST is really well done, and the music selection on the radios are also of a good mix. However, I did feel there were a couple extra covers than usual, and I don't know, I guess it felt a little more budget in that sense, but overall the songs were good. Continuing on with the general atmosphere of Fallout, there are plenty of holotapes and notes throughout the world, and I'll talk a little bit more about that soon, but for right now, focusing on the good aspect of them is that the Fallout humor or craziness is matched really well in this game, and that identity of Fallout is never completely lost, even though it is less accessible to people who don't want to read or do anything like that. And this is all delivered through dialogue from either holotapes or the occasional robot. There is a raider robot named Rose, who you actually do get to interact with through the other quest lines as well, which is something I'll talk about later, about the integration of side quest lines into the main quest line. But anyway, back to that dialogue for a second. I gotta say the voice acting in this game is, bar none, some of the best of Bethesda's, only because there seems to be a good bit of variety, and it only increases with the more content that was added to the game. All the emotions that were meant to be portrayed in the audio logs or even dialogue with these NPCs are done quite well, and that's where that humor or that bombastic craziness of Fallout really shines in Fallout 76. Continuing on with the general feel of the game, however, I have to say that even now, the visuals do look fairly dated. And while there were a lot of visual bugs when the game did come out that are, for the most part, gone, you'll have some here and there, but I believe the main reason why the engine seems even more dated here than something like Fallout 4 is I just don't think the graphics engine lends itself to the online aspect of the game very well. Furthermore, with the online aspect, server instability and lag tends to spike at certain times of day. It's hard to really pinpoint, but when it's bad, it's bad, but when it's fine, it works flawlessly. Unfortunately though, these spikes in instability cause more visual glitches that absolutely destroy immersion at times. One thing that I can say about the visuals that was really good was the photo mode that was added for Fallout 76, and that I hope they add to every BGS title from here on, was more or less way better than it ever needed to be. Plenty of camera positioning and end character poses as well as different filters to use make it one of the easiest to use photo modes I've ever seen that really helps show off the game when it actually can look really good. Stepping even further back into the world though, I will say that the enemy designs are some of the coolest, in my personal opinion, of all of the Fallout franchise. And this is as someone who's played Fallout 3, New Vegas, and 4. I won't lie, I haven't been into the early games as much, but I'd like to. To me, the idea of integrating urban legend as well as extensions of the lore with certain creatures, that it just makes sense that they are, you know, irradiated and they're in this world. This combination of the two enemy designs make it feel really well done. For instance, you could fight something like the Wendigo and then turn around and fight some ghouls. 
but on top of the ghouls there's also the scorched plague and these are going to act as your main ranged enemies that have guns but if those aren't enough you of course have super mutants as well as their hounds mothman or at least a form of him and scorch beasts as well the scorch beasts in particular hold a very menacing threat over the wasteland and you see plenty of times how they have torn apart different groups of people and many locations in the wasteland are pretty enjoyable to explore there are plenty of stories that are individually wrapped in each of these locations to tell, as well as an overarching plot from time to time. Exploring, as in all Bethesda games, always nets a reward, especially in the online nature of this one. You get caps for going places, you get photo mode frames for going to certain landmark locations, and of course that brings me to one of my first major points of this video. There have now been cosmetic seasons added to Fallout 76 where you have daily and weekly challenges to get the season's currency to make your way through and get plenty of themed cosmetic items for instance right now the theme is superheroes so you go through and you get sometimes it's just caps or repair kits but you also get certain items or outfits that you can craft in your workstation from then on and even high-end stuff like paint for your power armor as we focus in on this i have a few major thoughts first off it is free so any complaints about pay to win or you know you have to pay extra for a game you already paid for that's not it here however you can buy individual tiers like a battle pass in fortnite or any other game battle royale like that by simply playing the game you can earn these and a lot of times it's pretty easy to do however i must say due to the nature of how long these battle passes are or how long they're actually around i don't think they give you enough time to complete them for all the tiers unless you do want to buy them or unless you're willing to play every day but i can't lie you don't want to play fallout 76 every day you will burn out before you even complete the main stories now this doesn't apply to everyone, but the main players of Fallout 76 are the casual fans, not the hardcore fans who only go to New Vegas, and not the deniers who are never going to play the game again either. But with the addition of daily and weekly challenges, as well as a very unique and interesting world to explore, I have to say that the main gameplay loop of Fallout 76 is pretty fun, but there is one issue, and that's the combat. Fallout 76's combat is a lot closer to Fallout 4's than any other game in the Fallout franchise, with one key difference. It is, of course, always online game, so therefore VATS is not how it works in 4. In Fallout 76, there is no slowdown time or pause time for VATS. It is real time, but it gives you a percentage. You shoot when the percentage is highest. Now, this is one of the things I would praise Fallout 76 for. I think this is something that should be in all Fallout games as an option, or maybe even a perk if you don't want to do that pause combat. This personally is one of the biggest jumps in immersion I think Fallout has had in a little while, but that same hard-on the game has for immersion in that sense also kills it in the early hours for new players trying to get gear. In those beginning hours, scarcity of resources makes it hard to craft ammo as well as maintain ammo as you're taking out plenty of enemies while also trying to maintain your gear because Fallout 76 also marks the return of the Bethesda game equipment conditions. Personally, I remember back in Oblivion always having to get my armor repaired by someone because I never put anything into that skill personally. In Fallout 76, you have to do it yourself. Personally, I'm not the type of person to complain about this. It actually adds an extra level of agency to my player. I always make sure that I have the right items to repair at all times, as well as weapons. But the weapons don't bother me as much because you can choose different weapons. But armor, I only ever carry one set on me at a time. But while management of this resource is something that is always necessary, there is one thing that Bethesda has stepped back on a little bit. With the introduction of the One Wasteland update, players no longer get debuffs when they don't maintain their food or water meters. Circling back, the One Wasteland update was also the beginning of the cosmetic seasons as previously mentioned, but the most important part of the update was leveling for enemies was based off of the player nearest to them. The best way to describe is with the example that if I am playing a level 15 character, the enemies near me will be of equal or similar level to myself, but the level 200 character next to me will also experience those same enemies as close to level 200 enemies as well. This balance change made it to where Fallout 76 was accessible to all players around the map at any point in time, and with the inclusion of other points in the update, which generally made the game easier, this was a well-regarded update that includes to get expanded upon as we are now in, I believe, Season 5 of the Cosmetic Pass. While on the topic of leveling, however, I do feel it's important to mention the level-up system in this game. Unlike previous games in the Fallout franchise, where you would pick either a new perk or just an incremental upgrade to a 20% on small guns or something like that, in this game you have perk cards. 
Each level up to a certain point will allow you to choose a new attribute to put a skill point into, as well as a perk card that coincides with the number for each attribute. For instance, if you only have an 8 in intelligence, then you can only put 8 perk cards, or the equivalent of 8 perk cards, into intelligence. And equivalent by that I mean that if you have a level 2 perk card, that more than likely costs 2 points. There are rare exceptions and cards that can't be upgraded, but that is the general gist of how that works. After level 50, however, you'll no longer be able to continue selecting attributes, but you can continue earning cards in the hopes to get a card that more fits your playstyle and can continue to upgrade and strengthen your character. However, it's important to note that each character can have three different classes where you can choose three different sets of attributes that you can easily swap out of with a thing from your camp. Personally, I don't feel strongly one way or another about the perk card system, I think it is very limiting in certain ways, but due to the online nature of the game, I feel that's almost necessary. Though I will say that as someone in Bethesda games who is a hoarder in all ways, whether that be collectibles or leveling up their character all the way and getting all of the perks, it does hurt my soul just a little bit. So if that's how you feel, maybe this game will turn you off in the same way it's turning me off. The final major component of resource management is base building, and in this I'll go ahead and include upgrading weapons and, you know, different modifications for weapons, different things that you would do at your home base. Of course, the game puts emphasis on building or rebuilding America as you are from the vault that is meant to rebuild society. So therefore, it encourages you with tutorials as well as certain quests and daily challenges to build your base. Now you can get super creative with this or you can have a small shack in the woods with your stash and your crafting stations and that's good for some players. Me, I'm kind of in the middle ground. Sometimes I really want to go crazy with it, sometimes I'm only at my camp long enough to do what I need to do. Rounding out my thoughts on the open world and general feel of Fallout 76, the base game mostly in mind, I do have a few extra pros and cons that I couldn't really fit into my discussion up until this point. Starting with the cons, however, the radio sound design and more specifically the alerts that activate when doing certain radiant quests or things like that is really annoying. I don't know how else to say this, but it's pisses me off how annoying the sound effects are for the radio in Fallout 76. Especially when most of the time when it's tied to a daily quest or something which you're meant to do daily. And I'm throwing this to the end due to the no spoilery nature of this review. The end game with the nukes in the main story. There is more content to do after this point, but the end game of going into nuclear silos to launch nukes is some of the most boring content I've ever seen and it drags on and it's absolutely terrible. And this is another nitpick for me personally, but it's usually more common in the Elder Scrolls franchise rather than a Fallout, but it seems that you can join literally every faction in this game. Now there are new ones like the Responders or the Fire Breathers. Fire Breathers specifically are a group that target the Scorched enemies and Responders being made up of people who worked in emergency services before the war. There are also other factions that you'll be very familiar with. The Brotherhood of Steel is actually one that you can join before they even come to Appalachia. And there's another that I won't spoil at this time, but generally the gist is that I just don't like the idea of not having the choice of one or the other. I want to play, I want to join the good guys and not be able to join the bad guys. I want to join the bad guys and the good guys won't even let me join anymore. That's the kind of stuff that I want. And the only reason I even bring this under a microscope is because the design of Wastelanders and Steel Rain DLCs are so good. They just make the initial base game pale in comparison to the point where I almost feel like if you skipped the base game of Fallout 76 out of the initial gameplay loop of exploration and daily quests, you wouldn't miss out on much of anything. But finally, I'm not all mean because there are some really genuinely endearing traits of the Fallout 76 open world that I love. For instance, the idea that West Virginia was almost entirely automated even before the war, so after the war, that explains all the robots being around, and while there is the Scorch Plague that sent most people out of Appalachia or they've died, it makes sense why there's no NPCs, but the robots are there. Another nice thing about about the game is the UI in general. The little animated GIFs that play for quests, like the little pit boy shows up for certain things. It's all really nice to look at and adds a lot of flair to the game that I think would be very barren without it. And finally, the map of the game is just a beauty to look at. It's hand-drawn and it's very in detail and there's plenty of map markers that add great functionality throughout. So on a gameplay level, it works really well, but also aesthetically, it's very pleasing to look at. With these minor nitpicks and praises out of the way, I'd like to transition into the Fallout 76 Wastelanders expansion. Having released April 14th of 2020, the Wastelanders DLC promised a lot of things. Most importantly, NPCs were returning to Fallout 76. To read directly from the expansion's description, in Fallout 76 Wastelanders, people are coming back to West Virginia. 
Two vying factions are struggling to gain the upper hand as the secrets of West Virginia are revealed. The settlers have come to find a new home, and the raiders have come to exploit them. Embark on a new quest for the Overseer, forge alliances with competing factions, and uncover the truth of what's hidden in the mountains. There is a new main quest, uncover the secrets of West Virginia by playing through an all-new main quest starting from the very moment you leave Vault 76. And with the inclusion of human NPCs, there also comes choice and consequence. Alter the fates of those you meet with dialogue trees. Decisions affect your standing with each faction through an all-new reputation system. So working on this promise alone, there's a lot to take in from what the initial barren Fallout 76 experience was. NPCs, as well as player choice, which is something that even recent Bethesda games had lacked altogether. And in a general statement, I'll say this. Where Fallout 76 did disappoint me quite a bit and left a lot to be desired, Wastelanders cupped that up and made it something definitely worth experiencing at least once. As someone who only played w one other Fallout game twice, and that was Fallout 4, I was attracted to this game not because of its online nature, but rather the fact that it was more similarly in style with the Fallout 4 gameplay, as far as gunplay and things like that. However, using 4 as a direct comparison, I believe the skill checks as well as the dialogue counters is much better and more fleshed out than Fallout 4 ever was, which really says a lot about what Bethesda did and learned from the Fallout 76 mistake. There are plenty instances in the game where you can avoid certain combat or gameplay altogether by simply passing a skill check, these would normally be mundane tasks, but you can skip it altogether if your character fits the bill. Now, this isn't always the case. Of course, there will always be fetch quests as well as plenty of combat encounters to litter the Wastelanders DLC. That speaks more to the Bethesda open world, and while some of it's enjoyable, not all of it is. It will drag on from time to time, and that's why I recommend taking breaks while playing Fallout 76, especially if you're planning on hammering out all of the expansions. But one thing I must state about the Wastelanders DLC is the seamless integration into the base Fallout 76 game. As previously stated, the main story does pick up pretty quickly after leaving Vault 76. You'll meet a couple of NPCs where you can actually engage in dialogue almost as soon as leaving the vault, where they'll lead you towards the Duchess, where you'll get more of the main quest line as well as learn about the two viable factions. That same conversation, however, does switch between two NPCs, which it works really seamlessly when it works well, but there are times when the game has hiccups. You'll be waiting for the second character to start talking during a conversation, and they just don't. It takes a really long time, and I don't know if this is a server thing or just a bug in general, but it's really weird. But back on a more positive note, the integration of NPCs in locations that weren't even NPCs before. Farmers coming back and reclaiming lands, as well as hunters and other settlers all throughout the world really do make the game feel a lot more populated and lived in. However, these aren't the main appeals. There are certain locations that have been added to the world, for instance, Foundation as well as the Crater, which are the locations of the Settlers and the Raiders respectively. Now jumping straight into the bulk of this DLC, there are two factions in this game, and while it was a complaint earlier that you could join both, there is a reason that I do like it here. You get to learn a little bit about the Raiders as well as the Settlers, if you so desire, but eventually there will be a point of no return where you have to continue with either one or the other. Now when the Wastelanders DLC first came out, I did play as the Raiders, but then I went on and did the Foundation as well in my most recent playthrough for this review. I feel the need to compare them now because there's a lot of people that might see this video who won't want to replay the game just to do the different questline all the way through seeing as how most of it will be in one playthrough anyway. I personally believe that the Raiders had better characters and quests and were much more unique all the way throughout the experience. However, as someone who enjoys playing a good character from time to time, I believe that Foundation had much better motivations and an overall story arc. Though I will say, the writing in the Foundation questline did heed some continuity er errors from time to time. And I would almost argue the case that the Raider questline is almost unfairly more interesting than Foundation, leading players to almost need to play a bad character to get the better story. And without going into full spoilers territory, that is all I have to say about the story of the Wastelanders DLC. There are final points that I'd like to make about the expansion, however. Now, I would like to say that the DLC for Wastelanders is rather quite short. However, it does provide a great base for future expansions that we do get to see come to fruition with the Steel Rain and Steel Dawn DLCs. Another big point of interest for Fallout 76 is the fact that there's a heavier emphasis on all buildings being in one load. So therefore, you don't have a loading screen every building you go into. 
Now, of course, this isn't always the case. There's always going to be buildings and sections you're going to load into, and usually this is what separates the multiplayer element from the single player story progression elements. Now, I've got to say, with that being said, though, I found that for the most part, the frame rates didn't suffer in the high intensity areas that weren't loaded in by a different load. However, in multi level buildings, there were instances where the quest marker was not always right. I'm not a person who likes to always rely on them, but sometimes Fallout looks a lot samey, especially with the Fallout 4 and Fallout 76 aesthetic, and it's really hard to identify what you need sometimes. So let it be known that I did have a few frustrating moments that really made me want to quit playing for the night, and I had to power through just so I knew that I'd be able to play whenever I wanted to play again with no issues. But with these things aside, there is one final note that I did want to make about the Fallout 76 Wastelanders DLC, and that is the new endgame loot that we get. You will be collecting gold bullion, or the gold bars, to trade with a certain entity to get new high-level endgame schematics to make new weapons, armor for your base even, as well as other miscellaneous things that really flesh out the late-game content much better than I personally think the initial base games did. So to summarize everything I feel about Fallout 76 Wastelanders expansion, I believe the shorter and somewhat subpar storytelling of the expansion itself are subverted and very much forgivable by the seamless integration of NPCs, the locations, as well as the satisfying end game gameplay loop and the gameplay to play throughout it. Overall, as a free update, you can't really complain about this one, but it does thoroughly add a lot of value to the initial Fallout 76 purchase. In the final section of the video, where I'll be talking about the Brotherhood of Steel quest lines, I will be comparing a lot to the Wastelanders expansion, mainly due to the fact that this was the base for that expansion. But for right now, I have one other thing to talk about in Fallout 76 before that. It's a quick point, and that is the Atom Shop. The Atomic Shop in Fallout 76 is the in-game store. It's there that you'll find options for buying different cosmetic, whether that's buildables, skins for your weapons, or power armor, as well as different outfits and hairstyles for your character. While it is mostly just cosmetic and pretty run-of-the-mill stuff, my issue mostly comes in with the utility aspect. For instance, you can use atoms, which is the in-game currency that you can either buy with real money or earn very sparsely by doing in-game challenges. In that utility tab, though, you're going to get things like repair kits as well as carry weight boosters, all things to make the game much easier to play and much less annoying to play at certain points. And while I think this is fine as things that can be awarded, and they do give some away free, there's usually daily something they're giving away, whether it's a cosmetic item of cheap value usually, or a carry weight booster or something like that. I do think overall this is a kind of scummy thing to do. I think this is something that, if at all, it should be something that's earned and put very sparingly. I don't think it's something they should allow people to spend money on because personally I think it cheapens the experience for most players. But speaking of cheap, the Atom Shop is not cheap. As you'll see on the video playing of the Atom Shop on this video right now, you'll see some of the Atom Shop prices. Now to put that in comparison to as to what you're actually paying for, 500 Atoms is $4.99 US dollars. 1,000 Atoms, and you get 100 bonus Atoms, is $9.99 and as you continue. So most bundles in the game are 1,500. So no matter what, you're going to pretty much have to spend $20 to get them with some change left over. Either way, I believe the pricing is pretty egregious whether you want to use the Atom Shop or not. It's a nice little thing here and there, but for the most part, it's whatever. Though I do think some of the cosmetic and customization things for your camp are really cool. That's why, personally, I don't spend my atoms that I get in-game, and I've never spent money on the game outside of the initial purchase of the game. So therefore, if I see something that I really want and that I can't earn, I'm going to go ahead and just buy it. For instance, that turkey. But anyways, the egregious pricing of the Atomic Shop for Fallout 76 is something that I really needed to talk about before we move into the most recent and final expansion of Fallout 76 so far. Hopping into the Brotherhood of Steel DLCs, there are actually two, part one and two, which is Steel Dawn and Steel Rain consecutively. Steel Dawn releasing November 24th of 2020, and Steel Rain releasing July 7th of 2021, so pretty decent sized gap in between. And just like I did for Wastelanders, I'll talk about exactly what we know leading into the expansion itself, and that is that Paladin Leila Romani and her troops have arrived from California to establish a new Appalachian chapter of the Brotherhood of Steel, work with or against the other factions to achieve success. Visit settlements populated with new NPCs and unlock powerful weapons and armor from the Brotherhood Arsenal. Join in their mission to rebuild society and aid in securing valuable technology, but only you can determine how it will be used. Another big thing were the camp shelters, which is the build and decorate in a new underground instant spaces separate from your main camp, complete a new quest, and get your first shelter free. 
And to get it out of the way now, I'll say it, I haven't used the shelter at all, and I just haven't done it. I haven't accessed it. I'm sure as I continue playing Fallout 76, which I do intend to do after this review, I might use it then, but up until then, I don't plan to. But going right in with my critique of the Brotherhood of Steel expansion questline, I have quite a few things to say. The main questline of this DLC follows two main plot points led together by one overarching plot that just kind of culminates towards the end of the questline. Without saying too much about them, one of them involves a missing persons case, while the other one is the rising super mutant threat. And while the super mutant threat is always interesting and very scary at times, I personally thought the missing persons case was kind of shoehorned in, but as the questlines continued on and slowly linked together, I thought it was very interesting and unique. However, these of course are tied together by the tensions at the Brotherhood of Steel chapter themselves. But with the breakneck pacing of the expansion, the swapping back and forth between these two plot threads, which do eventually come together, it does really feel like you can get whiplash at some point. And I think overall that brings the experience down, but I think the content of the questline, as well as the moral questions towards the end that are being asked, are overall very good, much better than Wastelanders overall. And now that I've touched on all three of the major questlines of the game, it's important to note that I think all of these questlines really make the player, if you do all of them, explore the map as a whole. All the different biomes and a lot of the different locations you will be exploring. And I gotta say, this map is huge, and if you're going through the events and grinding out your dailies, you're gonna really notice that as well. But focusing back in on the Brotherhood of Steel itself for a second, I gotta say, the characters are really interesting. The main points of interest are Paladin Layla Romani and Knight Shin. These two are kind of at an opposing force throughout most of the expansion, but they're two very interesting characters, and the reason that they're at odds for most of it is coming from a backstory of a slow drip of information that you do get throughout the questline, and I really appreciate the game and the storytelling for not just giving you all of the information at once. Here or there, a character will offhandedly remark to a certain thing that may or may not have happened, and you as a player just have to question what exactly happened up until you finally do get that information. I have a lot of respect for this means of storytelling, and I think it works out really well in this case. And this is when Fallout is at its peak, I think. When you, as the player, interpret characters in different ways and in different meanings throughout an ever-expanding questline and new drip of information. I believe all the characters make twists and turns that are fairly expected if you knew their whole story off the bat, but you don't, and that's why I think this expansion works really well in that essence. But I'm still not sure how I feel about Fallout 76 Brotherhood of Steel questlines being considered a really good story or narrative overall. Do I think they're a far better improvement over the main questline and even Wastelanders to some degree? Yes, I do. But on its own, I don't think it really stands the legs of a normal Fallout game. Not that it should, it is only a side quest line after all, but it is meant to be the continuation of the Fallout 76 story. And while it may seem that most of my negativity does come towards the Brotherhood of Steel quest line, this is mostly aimed at both that and the Wastelanders expansion. These two things are great on their own when compared to Fallout 76 based story, and they each have content updates that add quite a bit to the game, and much more replayability and value for your dollar. And although that may seem a little gloom, I do have a few other positives to add before I get into my final verdict on Fallout 76. I'm gonna go ahead and throw it in here. I could have done it way earlier, but due to the fact that it is the Brotherhood of Steel, you know, big emphasis on power armor, I think power armor feels all the more important in Fallout 76 than it does in, say, Fallout 4 or the other games, because while it is very important to have carry weight, unless you have a build set up where you're more buffed if you don't have power armor, you're gonna use power armor to carry around some of that equipment as well as the protection that it provides. And the final big thing I had to say about Fallout 76 is that the community was always welcoming and very nice. I didn't play with a lot of people, you know, in a party per se, but any time that I needed help throughout the world, someone would drop an item, or someone would revive me, or even help me with the enemies that I was facing. It was great. Now, while I'm not a big fan of the pacing of the story itself, I have to say that the boss pacing and the boss fight encounters throughout the Brotherhood of Steel questline were very well done. There were times where it felt like a boss rush, where it was room after room, of different boss encounters, and then there were times where the actual atmosphere built up into a really great experience to a unique boss at that. This was one thing that I walked away from feeling really strong about, and it gave me a lot of hope for what they could do in the future with different events and expansions like this. But with all that being said, I'd like to move into my final verdict on Fallout 76 three years later with all of the content and DLCs added so far. The base game of Fallout 76 can be an expansive and immersive experience, 
if you take the time to read and listen to it. Fans of Bethesda will find familiar world building as well as aesthetic cues from the Fallout franchise that they know and love. But with that same Bethesda charm comes the same Bethesda bugs. Unfortunately, even three years later, whether it be visual glitches or server instability, there always seems to be a bug that's taking a toll on your immersion as a whole. Though I have to say, when everything flows together and the engine can keep up with whatever it is that you're doing, to quote the good man taught himself, it does just work. You'll find yourself in an expansive open world that could be very beautiful to look at. And while the initial release of the game saw a questline that was very boring and buggy to slog through, the Wastelanders as well as the Brotherhood of Steel questlines added much to the game in ways of both NPCs, advanced storytelling compared to what was previously there, as well as unique and interesting locations to explore and figure out their secrets. Though, while looking at these questlines under the lens that they are more of a sequel rather than just a side expansion, it's hard not to feel that there's a lot to be desired from something that is a continuation of the story of Fallout 76, even though it is better than the original. And while that may sound fairly negative, I believe that these expansions do well to make Fallout 76 a much better product, especially considering they were free as an update to anyone who already owned the game and as someone who's looking to buy it straight up, it adds a much better value to the product overall. Speaking on value though, I feel like it's important to note that Fallout 76 plays most closely to Fallout 4. Diehard fans of Fallout 4 will find their value quickly brought back through the gameplay alone on top of the stories added into the expansions. Overall though, this game is very different than anything else in the Fallout franchise. The closest comparison to be made is Fallout 4 with its mechanics of gunplay as well as building. If you're a diehard fan of that, you'll definitely find value here with Fallout 76. If you're not, and you're more of a lore buff, I honestly can say that you can skip this game. The self-contained nature of the narrative, as well as the earlier along timeline, you would have heard something about Fallout 76 and the events of it if it actually mattered to the overall lore. The Brotherhood of Steel questline does the most to tie into other games by simply making references to Elder Maxon. But that's really about it. To summarize, I believe Fallout 76 can be worth the price of admission if you're really into the gameplay mechanics introduced in Fallout 4 and the continuation of them. Outside of that though, you're not going to find any mind-bending narratives in Fallout 76. Unfortunately as it is, it's still Bethesda making these games. So with full confidence, I can say pick up this game on sale or not at all if you're really not that into Fallout. But one more time, there has been a lot of effort to turn this game around, and I do feel that deserves as much praise as possible. And that's not quite done yet either. If you're familiar with Fallout 3, then you'll know about the pit. The next content being added to Fallout 76 is called Expeditions. The first being to the pit, or Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, where you'll go through some story-oriented content that is meant to be repeatable, so more like a raid dungeon or something. But there you go, folks. There's my Fallout 76 three years later review. I appreciate you watching, and if you have made it this far, or if you skipped to the end to hear what I actually had to say, then consider sharing this video if you agree, or if you don't agree, then go ahead and like the video, because, uh, why not, I guess? But, yeah, thanks for watching. Bye.